Well, hello. My name is Frank Snyder. This is Calvary Baptist Church of Quincy, Michigan. And this is the weekend of May 10th, 2020. This is um, still in quarantine. And so we are currently having parking lot services on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. And certainly if you, you do not have a church home that is offering services, then we would uh, be uh, overjoyed to invite you out to our, our parking lot. We'd love to have you. And uh, so that'll be at 11 o'clock, Calvary Baptist Church of Quincy, Michigan, 770 East Chicago Road, Quincy, Michigan. Well, we're delighted that you're here, and this is Mother's Day weekend, and if uh, you fit the description of a mother, then uh, congratulations. We uh, want to uh, certainly want to express our appreciation to you. The message that I'm preaching today is not a Mother's Day message per se. Uh, it is continuing on in our study of the Gospel of John, but we certainly do not want to leave uh, mothers unrecognized. So we want to extend our appreciation to you uh, as uh, as a mom on this uh, particular weekend. So um, I invite you to get your Bible and turn to John chapter 21. We're going to be looking at a rather lengthy portion of Scripture, verses 1 through 14. So I'm not going to read the entire uh, portion at the outset of our message today in John chapter 21. I will, however... <clears throat> um, uh, read verses 1 through 4 of that uh, of that passage of Scripture. So, uh, if you have your Bible, John chapter 21, we're going to read just as verses 1 through 4, have a brief word of prayer, and then look at this narrative that, uh, that God, John, under inspiration of the Spirit of God, has imparted to us. Let's read verses 1 through 4. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples, at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, you uh, know how dependent we are upon you to glean uh, lessons from your word. We know that the Holy Spirit gives discernment. And so I pray for that, not only for uh, myself, but for those that are hearing give them discernment, help them to analyze and look at your word with with uh, eyes that are untainted by any preconceived notions, and I pray that you might help me to present it uh, in its purity and, its, and in its uh, uh, simplicity. Lord, we ask you to apply it to our hearts today, and we thank you, Father, for mothers and, and this particular weekend. We thank you for them, and uh, pray for moms that they would especially glean some things for from God's word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When Leonardo da Vinci was 43 years old, the Duke of Ludovico of Milan asked him to paint a dramatic scene of Jesus' last supper with his disciples. Working slowly and with meticulous care, da Vinci spent three years on the assignment he grouped the disciples into threes, two groups on either side of the central figure of Christ. Christ's arms are outstretched. In his right hand, he holds a cup painted beautifully with marvelous realism. When the masterpiece was finished, the artist said to a friend, Observe it and give me your opinion of it. The friend exclaimed, It's wonderful. The cup is so real, I cannot divert my eyes from it. And immediately da Vinci took a brush and drew it across the sparkling cup, and he exclaimed as he did so, Nothing shall detract from the figure of Christ. Christ was the central figure of the Last Supper. Well, today 
we look not at the Last Supper. We are looking today at the Last Breakfast. And the Lord is still to be the central figure. In John's narrative of his gospel, this chapter, chapter 21, is considered by many scholars to be more of an appendix or a, an epilogue. Many Bible scholars believe that the Gospel of John is actually completed in chapter 20 at the end with Thomas's declaration as Jesus as his Lord and his God. This is followed by Jesus' blessing on those that believe without seeing. Chapter 21 is there, it is said, because there is unfinished business that needs to be dealt with in regard to Peter and the other disciples. Now, this narrative begins in a very significant place. It's on the shore of, uh, as it's referred here in, in verse 1 of John 21, the Sea of Tiberias. Now, you may recognize this as the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, the Lake of, of Chinnereth, um, it's all the same body of water. Uh, the Lake of Gennesaret uh, is also another name. So it's had several names through the years, but it's the same body of water. It's about 12 miles long, 7 miles wide, and 32, approximately 32 miles all the way around uh, the sea or the Lake uh of, of Galilee. It's a very, very beautiful lake. I've been on that uh, lake, took a little cruise on that lake. Um, a lot of lessons uh, connected with this body of water. A lot of Bible narrative in the New Testament is connected with this water. The stilling of the storm, Jesus walking on the water, Peter being bidden to come to Jesus on the water. There were lessons on authority and lessons of trust, lessons about fear there pertaining to uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee. So it's a very significant place in the scripture. Now, Jesus appears along the shores there of the Sea of Tiberias, Sea of Galilee, to seven of the disciples. Um, verse 2 names at least five of those disciples, Simon Peter, Thomas called Digimus, Nathaniel, uh, James and John, sons of Zebedee, and two others. Um, why were they there? Well, the scripture tells us that uh, after the initial appearances of Christ in, in Jerusalem, that Peter decides, I'm going to go fishing. Uh, sometimes people have attached meaning to that. Um, these seven or so that were included in, in, in the, this project of going fishing were fishermen by trade. Um, someone's asked, well, why seven, not the entire 12? Well, not all of them were fishermen. Matthew was, and, and all of them were not uh, fishermen by trade. Some have said, well, Peter was returning to his old life. He was making the decision to backslide. So he says, I go a fishing. There's no indication of that, in my opinion, in the scripture, uh, that Peter was somehow backsliding. Uh, they needed money to live. They needed to earn money. And uh, so uh, he did not have an income coming in. Um, so he went back to his trade of fishing and the others went with him. Uh, Peter still had to get by in this world. And so in, in, in and of itself, I don't think the fact that Peter says he's going fishing means that, that uh, he was backsliding or that this had any spiritual uh, significance at all. Um, others followed him. When he said, I'm going fishing, the other said, we're going with you. Why? Well, because Peter was a leader of men. He did not necessarily want to be a leader or try to be a leader, but he was one nonetheless. Someone said the test of leadership is not a title. The test of leadership is whether or not anyone is following. And Peter certainly was a leader. He was a natural leader, but he was also an appointed leader. Um, he was the one to whom Jesus had said that um, uh, you are Peter upon this rock. I will build my church. Uh, the keys of the kingdom and so on in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 16 were, were given to him. So there was a certain level of authority. Uh, this was never intended to bestow upon Peter some infallibility or some kind of, of um, authoritative role over all of the apostles and all the church and that they were supposed to knuckle under uh, to him and, and, and 
things that he spoke authoritatively on. There was never that suggestion, but there isn't any denial that he was put in a position of leadership. It's interesting to me that verse 2 leads out, noting the two disciples that made the most vocal denials of Jesus. Uh, Peter, of course, uh, but also uh, Thomas that we just uh, got done studying in this past week. So here they were along the Sea of Galilee, a very significant uh, place there, and they go fishing. They fished all night, but they caught nothing, verse 3 tells us. Fruitless effort, hard work, uh, disappointing outcome. This kind of fishing was not the same as being out on a rowboat or motoring out on the lake or pond with your rod and reel and a can of worms. This was throwing out a big net and allowing that net to sink down. And the net was uh, was made out of, uh, of a porous material that got wet and got heavy. And so they, they, it, was a, it was a lot of muscle involved and a lot of energy involved. Very hard work as they drew in the net, especially after it was wet. And like many a fisherman has experienced, they fished and caught nothing. Very common occurrence. Anyone who has gone fishing has had this happen. You go for hours and hours and catch nothing, and then you fish different spots and uh, fish formerly fruitful spots and come back empty. Um, you wonder if every fish in the lake has has died. Uh, once a friend and I went out to a lake, one of his favorite lakes, and he, I, I remember he told me that this lake had huge, huge fish called uh, tiger muskies. And so he was telling me about these, and I had high expectations as we went out on this lake. So we went out there, and we went all up and down the lake, and patrolling and so on, and nothing. So we switched, and we went to, uh, to using bait and uh, rather than spin, spin baits. And, and I remember seeing a fish down underneath the water and actually dangling my baited hook and hitting the fish in the front on, on his nose, and he turned and swam away. We finally, after after a long while fishing, catching nothing, went back to the shore, and there was a boater there getting ready to come out on the lake. And he tells us that the Department of Natural Resources had poisoned that lake the day before in order to get rid of the small fish, to kill off the small fish that were eating up the food supply for the larger fish. And the poison didn't kill the larger fish, but it did make them pretty nauseated. So no one likes to eat when they're nauseated. So it would have been nice if someone had told us beforehand, but it's a frustrating thing to fish any length of time and not catch anything. But it's a common occurrence. And the Lord asks a very conventional question. In verse 5, Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? Have you any food? Did you catch anything? And they answered him, no. Now, that's, that's a common question, isn't it? Uh, the term translated children is actually a, a kind of a term of endearment. It would be like, hey, kids, catch anything? Uh, have any luck? Do any good? Are they biting? So Jesus asked the question, why? Why did he ask the question? Was it because he didn't know that they had not caught anything? God's questions are not asked to gain information. God's questions are designed to get us to think about our circumstances. God didn't ask Adam and Eve, where art thou? Because they were good at hide and seek. Um, he didn't ask Cain, why are you angry? Because he didn't know. After Cain slew Abel, God asked Cain, what is, it that, what is this that you have done? Not because God uh, didn't know, but he wanted Cain to see the enormity of what he had done. God asked Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? It wasn't because God was puzzled. And when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, his design was to get Peter to think through his theology of who Jesus really was. Listen, these questions are not designed uh, to be asked to gain information, but to uh, analyze our circumstances. Have you any meat? And they answered, no. And so then the Lord gives some unconventional fishing advice, fishing instruction, in verse uh, 
6, he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. So they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of the fishes. Now, he says, well, you're essentially, your problem, you're not, you're not fishing on the right side. Um, there's, it always seems like there's somebody that's wanting to tell you how best to catch fish. They're telling you what your problem is. You know, you're not using the right bait. You're not using the right technique. You're not using the right setup. But the Lord is telling them they were not fishing on the right side of the boat. And can you imagine someone pulling up to you and telling you that your problem was that you were not dipping your line on the correct side of the boat? So this fruitless effort magnified by someone from the shore. And by the way, uh, it was a significant length, uh, length of distance, excuse me. A distance from the shore that was uh, I think the scripture says 200 cubits or so and uh, that's approximately 18 inches so you're talking about in a cubit that is and you're talking about a hundred yards plus it was morning we're not told exactly when in the morning it may have just been breaking uh, dawn there may have been mist along the shoreline um, so anyway they see a figure who is asking them how they're doing fishing wise and they haven't caught anything and so on so here is the narrative up to this point at this point though when they struck gold if you will in the fishing business when they had a full net there was recognition and this uh, immediately john said and this is the referred to as the disciple whom jesus loved verse seven therefore that disciple whom jesus loved saith to peter it is the lord it is the Lord. There was recognition. Now, in part, the recognition was because this was a very familiar um, scenario. This has happened before, and it's recorded in Luke chapter 5 uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Again, they had fished, caught nothing, and Jesus said, let, let down your nets and so on. Uh, let me just read a portion of that narrative in Luke chapter 5. And this is in verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answered, answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when, he had, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. There had been another night of defeat and uh, a night of nothing prior to this. And so this event, even though they couldn't clearly see who the Lord was on the shoreline, didn't recognize from his voice or even seeing his person, the scenario was very, very similar. Uh, the scenario of an authoritative a mandate, let down your nets, do what I tell you to do, and you will catch fish. This was a command given, an authoritative command given to the disciples. It was a Lord and God moment. You remember that John's emphasis is on the deity and lordship of Jesus, and the filling of this net with fish is demonstrating Jesus' authority over nature. It was a demonstration of what manner of man that Jesus was, uh, as you know, in previous passages says that even the winds and the waves obey him, well, even the fish obey him. And so he gave this authoritative command, this authoritative display of himself to the disciples and, and to the fish, so that both responded, and there became this discernment moment, this aha moment. And it had nothing to do, as in the previous narrative, with, with imprints in the hands or a gash in the side. This had everything to do with their previous experience of Jesus. And up till then, they were a good hundred yards away, or perhaps, uh, perhaps there was mist or fog, and they didn't really realize who he was by sight. Recognized by John initially, the disciple that Jesus loved is how he's referred to in verse 7. And then he says to Peter, 
that it is the Lord. So it's recognized by John and reacted to by Peter. Now, what did Peter do? Look at verse 7. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat upon him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Uh, John makes note that Peter was out there working without any clothes on. It's an interesting word. The word naked in the Greek language is the word gumnas, from which we get our word gymnasium. And um, it was the word for athletes that athletes would use. Well, they would work out. Athletes in the Olympics and so on would perform and work out naked. Hence the word uh, gumnas, gymnas. So uh, Peter was working and uh, had was out in the lake at night. Nobody around but us chickens, you know. Nobody, nobody around but the guys. And so here he was. But when he saw the Lord, when he recognized it was the Lord, the first thing he did was put his fisher's coat upon him. Um, John was the first to perceive Christ, but Peter was the first to struggle to get to him. And his first, his first action was was to put on a a wrap that was around his waist, tied tied up around his waist at, at minimum. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, it doesn't matter how you're dressed. Well, you know, yes, it is true that the Lord looks on the heart, but there's appropriate and there's inappropriate. And apparently Peter did not believe that the heart was the main thing because he had the sense to realize that he was in no condition uh, to appear before the Lord. He had some semblance of reverence and respect and something I would say that is a, that is very lacking in our day. So Peter immediately says, I, I'm inappropriate. He closes himself, jump, jumps into the, into the drink and makes uh, and swam like Tarzan to get to the shore uh, to, to Jesus. And as I said, it was about 100 yards. So he forgot about the fish in the net. He forgot all about rowing back to shore. He had only one thing on his mind, and that was coming to Jesus. He was appropriately motivated to come, to get to the Lord. Jesus, at that moment, was the central most important person on Peter's, Peter's mind in that moment. He was, he had but one objective, and that was to get to the Lord Jesus. Folks, that ought to be the central most issue for everyone, is to be in fellowship uh, with the Lord, to come to him. There was a theological student years ago from England that was sent by his professor to hear a noted preacher on the weekend and so he came back after the weekend was over. He came back to the class at the theological school, and he had the student had kind of a, a sophisticated disgust and said to his professor, "That man didn't do anything but say, "Come to Jesus." And did they come? His professor gently inquired. Well, yes, they did. The theological student replied. The professor then said, "I want you to go back and listen to that man preach again, and until." You can say, come to Jesus as he did, and people respond. Listen, that is crucial. The idea of, of fellowship with Jesus, coming to Jesus. There were still some concerns that Peter had to settle with Jesus. There were some matters that needed to be addressed and some loose ends tied up. And we'll get to those probably in a, in a future message. Uh, Peter knew that, though, that some things needed to be settled, but all that mattered to him at that moment was getting to the Lord, the single most important thing to him. I would ask, is that the single most important thing to you? So, this special place, on the being served in with fruitless effort, Recognition of the Lord is here in these verses 6 and 7. And then we see a remarkable account in, in the provision of the Lord. Now, I want us to think about just a moment the uh, contrast with the Lucan account, which with Luke's account of the uh, fishing all night and catching fish and so on. In uh, this account, they, uh, they kept the fish. In this account, the net did not break. Uh, we're going to find that they they partook of the fish that they had caught. Uh, there were, there are some distinctions, and the reason I'm pointing that out is is that some 
liberal scholars have said, well, this is a conflation of two accounts and that there were actually just one account, or excuse me, yeah, uh, there's actually just, just happened one time, but Luke and John got them mixed up, and so this was a blending. No, that's not how it happened. There were two different events that took place, which made the recognition of John immediately, because he connected the event that happened that Luke records when in Jesus' earthly ministry, and that's how they identified the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are great similarities between the two accounts, but there are distinctions, there are contrasts between the, the two, which, which mark it as being a completely separate event. Now, what are the principal lessons as we proceed through here? Let's, um, let's look at verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, about 100 yards, dragging the net with fishes. And soon then, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, 150 and three, and for all they were, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing? that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Now, note what John notes, because the, the, the emphatic truths here, the, the truth embodied in this passage is that Jesus provided for the disciples. These are the principal lessons. Number one, the provision of Jesus. While they were out fishing and catching nothing, Jesus was waiting and providing for them. He had been preparing this for them for a while. This The fire did not just appear when they caught this load of fishes. The fish that were already cooking and the bread had been there uh, roasting on, on the fire uh, prior to the, the disciples coming to land. So this was something that the Lord Jesus had prepared for them. He had started the fire and it had turned to coals and he had caught fish and wrapped them up in leaves or some sort of covering. He had either bought or made bread. It was cooking there. And when they brought the other fish, he tells them to bring them over. So there was a time frame here. Presumably he prepared all of these fish, even the, of the fish that they had brought over. And then after a while, he gives them an invitation. We see the invitation to fellowship. Come and dine. So, one writer said this concerning this. Dining in Bible days was not simply a matter of, of sitting down and woofing down your food. It was a time of fellowship together. And this writer said the invitation involves fellowship with Jesus and not merely physical provision. In the Bible, eating always suggests fellowship. For us, eating is often a hurried thing, something we do on the run to some other activity. We grab a sandwich and a glass of milk. We buy a hamburger and eat it in the car. This was not possible in Bible times. Meals required preparation, and they were more drawn-out affairs. And consequently, to eat with a person was to have fellowship with him or her. Jesus took the time to prepare these individuals, his disciples, this meal. It was a time of fellowship. The last breakfast was not something that was hurriedly put on, but it was a time of fellowship. You know, I think especially during this time of quarantine, we haven't realized the value, or perhaps we have realized the value of fellowship. I hope hope that you have missed uh, this time of fellowship. But when we've had church dinners, quite often people don't stay. Quite often uh, people only sit down with the people they already are friends with and know. Listen, church fellowships, breaking bread around the table ought to be a time of communion together. It ought to be a time of conversation and not a time of fellowship together. But that was the purpose of dining together. You know, we, uh, we treasure those moments. Scripture says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen, fellowship 
around the table is supposed to be a community of believers and especially getting to want to know one another and, and interacting one with another as one with another as believers. But this incident goes far beyond the idea of fellowship with Jesus. There is something more. It certainly is an invitation when Jesus says to come and dine, but it is also a demonstration of caring. Now, let me direct you to verse 13 here. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Jesus then cometh. I thought this was an odd uh, construction when I was studying this. This phrase, Jesus then cometh uh, and gives them. It, uh, where was Jesus if he was coming from somewhere? I, but I looked up the word translated cometh, and it is a word that means to come or it means go. It can mean come or go. So was the Lord coming or going? And the answer to that question is yes. What he was doing is that he was going to the fire, getting um, getting food, getting, a, getting fish or getting bread, and then taking that to each one of the disciples and serving them. And then he would go back to the fire and then he would go serve another disciple and he was hand delivering their meals to them. That is the, that is the context. That is what the verse 13 tells us. That he is coming and going and serving the disciples, going to the fire, getting their fish and bread from where it was in the coals and then coming and bringing each disciple his breakfast and serving each one uh, individually. He didn't say, okay, guys, it's self-serve, get in the line, it's potluck, serve yourself. Uh, that's not how it was. Keep in mind, they had been working all night. They were tired. They were whipped. Jesus tells them, essentially, come come to dinner, and then he gets each one of their meals and said, here, here you go, enjoy. The Lord was taking care of his disciples. He was serving them. The resurrected Lord, and the one whom Thomas had called my Lord and my God, has now cooked breakfast, made a fire. You know, the, think about this. Who made the fire? Jesus did. Fish were already being cooked. Who caught the fish? Well, they either came to him and jumped into his hands, or he caught them. The bread was there already. Who brought the bread? Jesus did. Who invited everyone to come? Eat. Jesus did. Who served breakfast? Clearly, Jesus, the master of the universe, creator of heaven and earth, served breakfast. The indication is that Jesus labored and worked and served, and that this was not done by, by miraculous means. He could have snapped his fingers, and their breakfast could have been teleported through time from McDonald's in individual bags with a wet wipe included. But he made it himself, and hand delivered it himself. You know, there's nothing more like the Lord than in serving others in hospitality. There is nothing that says welcome more than that. There is nothing that demonstrates warmth and generosity, cordiality and openness more than serving someone else. There's nothing more that says I care about you and your comfort than serving others chosen. The Lord was doing that. But he was also in showing us that showing someone else a model for believers. This was a paradigm, a pattern, was for all of them in particular, but especially for one specifically. If you look in the latter verses, and we're not we're gonna deal with these a little more thoroughly later, but look at verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He says it again after he asks him if he loves him in verse 16. But at the end of the verse, Jesus said, Feed my sheep. John chapter 21 and verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, what? Feed my sheep. Now, what had Jesus just got done doing? The Lord Jesus had just got done cooking bread and fish and then delivering it 
each one of those those disciples his last the last breakfast that he would have with them on, in this world. He is loving his disciples and demonstrating that love by cooking and serving breakfast to them. And now he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. He said, okay, feed my sheep. What did Jesus just got done doing? He fed his disciples. And what he is telling Peter is, I want you to take care of my boys. I want you to, uh, I'm not going to be around here. I want you to watch over them. I love these guys. Do you love me? Tend to them. Watch over them. Be a shepherd to them. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know, in scripture, it tells us that um, we are to, by love, serve one another. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Philippians 2, 3 tells us, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. What? was Jesus doing? Well, he was serving, like, like a slave would do. But he's serving as someone that loves the people that he's serving. This is not like at the cafeteria line back in, back in grade school where, they, where you had a tray and they eat each, at each station somebody would slop some macaroni and cheese or some fruit cocktail on your plate. This wasn't done like this was very tenderly and lovingly done, individually serving these disciples. It's an interesting thing that at the Last Supper, he washed the disciples' feet like a slave would do. At the Last Breakfast, he served the disciples' food like a slave would do. But he served like that as an illustration of what a loving shepherd would do. But that's the Lord. And that's the Lord at the Last Breakfast. We used to sing a song years ago, Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people, come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis, tis, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. The disciples came to land, thus obeying Christ's command for the master called unto them, come and dine. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfied the hungry every time. Soon the lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will assemble be. Oh, twill be a glorious sight, all the saints in spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the master called. Come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine to the hungry calleth him. 